Yes, okay. Um, so I'm introducing Steve Geyer Sensei from Herndon, Virginia. Steve Wolf Sensei is here from Maryfield, Virginia, from the Virginia Key Society, one of the oldest dojos in the state, and we'll look forward to hearing about that. Uh, Yvonne Thelwell Sensei from uh, Aikido of Arlington in Arlington. And uh, Dave McConnell Sensei. Dave, remind me the name of your group. Uh, the Nishio Aikido Keiko Kai of Northern Virginia. Okay, uh, currently training in Stafford and Springfield and other parts nearby. And Truman Cap Capone Sensei from Kodakon Aikido in Blacksburg. Uh, has a lot of uh, students from Virginia Tech and a lot of people come through there in their own Aikido development. Uh, we're also hoping to be joined by Brian Erickson Sensei um, from Herndon. And so that's our panelists today. The first question I'd like to pose to everybody is, you know, just um, how did you get here? How did your dojo get here? How did you get here? How did your style of Aikido come to evolve? And we'll take about five minutes each to, to go over this. And uh, we're going to run the first set of questions alphabetically by first name. Uh, my teacher in Japan, Saito Shihan, always said, Aikido wa kazoku desu. Aikido is family. And so here in our dojo, we, uh, we call each other by first names. And so we're going to start with the alpha sort by uh, first name. And guess what? I'm the first. <laughs> now, I think, it's, uh, I think it's actually appropriate because my dojo has a lot of connections with all of these other dojos, for which we're really grateful for. Um, in terms of myself, I began training uh, Aikido in the mid-70s at the New York Aikikai, which is a U.S. Aikido Federation school and the headquarters of the U.S. Aikido Federation. And I was just a teenager, so I moved around. I lived in, uh, in um, Blyville, Arkansas, and I trained a version of Key Society there called Seikikai Aikido. And I lived in Syracuse, New York, and trained uh, another U.S. Aikido Federation uh, dojo there, led by Yusuf Metter Sensei, who has retired uh, to Virginia here. And then finally, I moved to Reno, Nevada, where the only Aikido that was there was Iwama-style Aikido. And I didn't know anything at all about styles of Aikido. I just knew there was Aikido. Uh, but... Uh, the Iwama style of Aikido really spoke to me. It's very methodical. Put your foot here, put your hand there, stand up straight, bend your knees, breathe. And you only have to hear that about 5,000 times before you put it into use. <laughs> um, I was running a dojo there uh, called uh, Reno Aikido Co-op. And both my wife and I wanted to um, move back to the East Coast. Uh, we're both from... Uh, New York and we wanted to have something that was greener and four seasons. And so we found this piece of property here and, um, and, and moved here in uh, 2002. In the late 90s though, uh, there was already a group here in Fredericksburg called the Fredericksburg Aikido Club. It was led by uh, Dwight Peterson, who was a shodan at the time. He got his shodan from Sao Tome Sensei and uh, he didn't really feel that as a shodan, there was that much that he had to offer. So he would bring down uh, teachers from Northern Virginia. And so um, Bob Galini came down and Jim Sorrentino came down. And also uh, one of the other senior students, Robert Kravitz, who's on the call here today, um, he had had some exposure to the Key Society. And so uh, Steve Wolf Sensei's teacher um, came down. And one of uh, Steve's peers, um, Steve came down. And so our dojo has at, at its root, a lot of other influences. Uh, Yvonne Sensei and I met um, on the West Coast years ago at a seminar. Uh, Dave McConnell trained in Thailand with one of my senior students who used to be one of Yvonne Sensei's senior students. And, um, you know, the Blacksburg connection is strong. We get people who graduate from tech and come here and train. And, um, you know, it's just fantastic. 
Uh, it really disheartens me when I hear about politics in Aikido. And uh, so myself and the other instructors here in Virginia, we've all really worked hard to work together and to, to not worry so much about Aikido politics. We get enough politics because we're so close to DC, uh, but we're training uh, together in a cooperative fashion now and then. And here in our dojo, what we're doing is Iwama style Aikido. That was the Aikido that was taught by uh, O Sensei to Saito Morihira Shihan in the Iwama dojo. And personally, I had a relationship with Saito Sensei starting in 1987, extending to his death. The last time I was in Iwama was for an extended stay in 2001. And um, we followed the principles. We've built a beautiful dojo here in Fredericksburg um, based on the concept of the Iwama dojo where students come and live. And so we have Uchi Deshi who are here and train regularly. And pre-pandemic, we had 25 classes a week uh, something for every different uh, age group and uh, experience level. And we've been fortunate that during the pandemic, we've been able to keep things going. So we focus on traditional training. Um, we are doing a lot of weapons practice now. That's a big part of, uh, of our history. And we have an outdoor space as well. And, um, you know, that's our history. Uh, I got here because Dwight uh, Peterson ran an ad in one of the two Aikido uh, magazines at the time. There used to be these things called magazines that you'd open and in the back there were ads and there was this little tiny ad that said, Sensei Wanted. So uh, <laughs> I took the bait and we started corresponding in the 90s and uh, by 2002 I was here and, and we've been training together ever since and I'm happy that, that Dwight Peterson and Bob Kravitz uh, who were among the members of the founding Fredericksburg Aikido Club are still training Aikido. And in fact, one more connection uh, before I turn over the, um, the chair here. Dwight has moved to uh, Greenville. And so he's training in a dojo that's affiliated with Truman Sensei. So there's Aikido everywhere. It really enriches us. And uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing about everybody's individual inspiration and how you got here in Virginia. We're relatively new. We've only been here 19 years. And so I know there's a, a deeper history that we're going to explore now. Um, our next speaker will be Dave McConnell Sensei. And Dave, why don't you expand on the introduction and um, you know, tell us how you got here. Okay. Well, Avi Sensei, thank you very much for the kind invitation. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here with the other panel members. Um, I'm uh, relatively the new, the new, the new kid on the block here in Virginia. Um, I arrived in Virginia in uh, May of 2015 from overseas, uh, where I spent a significant amount of time uh, during my uh, career. Um, I began my martial arts journey back in the early 1970s as a kid with judo, uh, Western boxing, uh, Korean styles of uh, karate, taekwondo, tang sudo for about 10 years. And then about 1986, I got introduced to Okinawan karate. 1987, I was uh, in the United States Marine Corps and I was posted on Okinawa. And I spent, had the luxury and the privilege of spending a year there uh, training with Shun, Shunbukuro Izu Sensei. And then following that, I relocated to Camp Pendleton, California, where I ended up training with Arsenio James Avicula Sensei, who's a well known uh, Ishinru uh, instructor who has significant ties to Okinawa due to the amount of time that he spent there. Um, that kind of ties into how I got into Aikido, actually, because uh, in uh, 1997, I was living in Arlington for about a year uh, while I was going to language training to learn the Thai language where I was going to be posted. And I was working for a part of that time with a man named John Driscoll, who at the time I think was training with Yvonne Sensei, I believe. And uh, when I was living in my apartment there, I would go by a few times to, I think where your dojo used to be, Yvonne Sensei, a jog, go, go running. 
And it was at a church, I believe, maybe on Jackson Street, if I can, somewhere near Boston. But every time I went, it was closed. <laughs> and anyways, I was busy with school for the year-long program I was in and uh, eventually get posted overseas a year later. John Driscoll follows me in a different position over there, but he's assigned uh, with me at the U.S. Embassy in Bangkok. And uh, since I knew him from work, um, we had a common connection uh, and he asked if I could teach him Okinawan karate. So for about two years, we would meet uh, two or three mornings a week at uh, 6 a.m., uh, an ungodly hour, but that's what we would do. And we would train in a racquetball court in my, uh, the apartment building I lived in for about two hours and then we go to work. And it was during that time where John started introducing me to Aikido techniques and you could see how effective they were. And I always had an interest in Aikido. And uh, here I have a guy who studies Aikido practicing with me. So from there, John introduced me to uh, his sensei uh, at the time, Tony Tartaglia sensei, who is uh, quite a uh, legend, so to speak, in the Aikido world. Tony was uh, originally one of Dr. Walker's students in Florida and with the Sands Drift Aikikai. And in the 1973, I believe, he went to Japan on a study trip with Aikido with Dr. Walker Sensei, and he ended up staying for about 14 years. And he trained at Hombu uh, during that time. And he became very close with uh, Doshu, uh, the current Doshu, uh, who was around the same age as him, uh, with. Uh, then with uh, Satomi Sensei as well. And he eventually moved back to the US for about a year or two. And he trained, he knew Yamada Sensei from Japan. And eventually he went back to, went back to Japan and stayed in Asia. And Tony had a small dojo in Bangkok uh, that was unaffiliated at the time uh, called the Mushin Ronin Aikikai. And John Driscoll and another fellow named Nixon Frederick, uh, who I know well, uh, introduced me to Aikido there. So I started off in uh, 2002 with Tony and um, trained there for a number of years. And I came back to the States and I was in the uh, northwestern Indiana area uh, uh, in near Chicago. And I trained in a key society dojo uh, there with Elizabeth Menning Sensei, who was phenomenal. Was there for about four years, and I went back overseas with the Mushima Raiki Kai. In 2003, we began a relationship with a recent way, uh, Takeo Risue Sensei from Japan, and that whole relationship developed through Tony because Tony was friend and studied with Nishio Sensei during his time in Japan. And Nishio Sensei uh, was in ill health at the time, and he sent a Risue Sensei to come and help our dojo to teach and then also to help us get affiliated with the Aikikai, which eventually happened. Um, so every year since 2003, uh, we've made yearly trips to Japan, our, our small group. There was only about nine of us in the dojo and they would come and train with us. So we began this relationship back in 2003 with the Risui Sensei and the Warabi Dojo and uh, for 17 years now, um, we've had a very strong relationship, but that relationship took time to develop because every year we would go to Japan and we would train. But initially we went and we would go to these large gosh foods and seminars for about two years. And then we decided, you know, maybe it's better if we just do dojo trips and we train a dojo. So we did. So every year we would go and there were three different dojos. And then the fourth one would be Hombu where we would go and train over that period of time, and eventually we developed this relationship. And then, so Dave, so Dave, you retired and came back to Virginia, was it last year or the year before? I came back in January 2019, yes, sir. So initially, I got to Virginia in May of 2015 uh, from overseas, and I was looking for a place to continue my Aikido practice, and Aviv Sensei was good enough to uh, let me join his dojo. And I trained there on and off for about two years, and then I went back overseas, and then I came back here. Prior to me returning here, I was in Tokyo for one of our annual trips, 
in October of 2018, and uh, we were at dinner. And one of my senseis had mentioned that they wanted, they would be very happy to have a Tamono no Kai, a friendship organization with me in Virginia and Nixon Frederick in New York. Great. So the Nishio Aikido in the U.S. is a very small community. There's a presence, uh, several dojos in the, on the West Coast, in the Los Angeles area there. Uh, there's one dojo in Texas. There's Tom Huffman Sensei, who was in uh, Florida. Great. And then there's myself and Nixon Frederick in, in New York. So it's a very small community. Great. I so. appreciate that intro, Dave. And um, I look forward to hearing more about, you know, what distinguishes Nishio style Aikido in, in the next round of discussions. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Stephen Geyer Sensei. You're muted. Still muted. Stephen, yeah, your sensei, please unmute yourself. Okay. Okay. Thank Not you. I put that on it. Um, Brian Erickson gave me a call. Um, uh, he should be getting on shortly. I told him that you have an assistant that will be able to process him in, even though you are participating in the ongoing. Um, I started, uh, like the flyer says, out in California back in 66. Uh, Isao Takahashi was my first instructor who gave me my initial impressions of Aikido, ones that have lasted uh, um, to this day, uh, pretty much as the motivations of what Aikido should uh, be like, feel like, seem like, do like. And uh, since that time, I've had uh, a number of uh, instructors, of course, uh, that would include having gone through a period where I was a member of the Key Society. Uh, I was actually in a group which um, had been courted uh, during the time that Tohei Sensei was considering his split. So at the split time, we did uh, follow um, Tohei and uh, that was uh, under uh, Kobayashi, Rob Kobayashi Sensei out in California. Um, I had been a student of Robin Heifetz, uh, which was one of his uh, leading instructors there and also uh, was responsible for introducing uh, Aikido, or at least Tobe Aikido into um, Israel. Um, so eventually uh, I had to move due to job <laughs> and uh, by that time I had uh, already uh, been involved with Barry Sensei uh, that began around 1980 so I had about 13 years with him before I came out here. Um, the uh, I had a relationship uh, with uh, Stephen Seagal's Tenshin Dojo uh, through uh, a student of mine in California who wanted to do uh, more training than I had scheduled for because uh, I was not a full-time Aikido instructor. I was, uh, call it a, an amateur in the sense that I did it for love and on the side and um, he wanted more. So uh, I recommended uh, to him that uh, he uh, look into the Tenshin Dojo and as a consequence of that relationship um, when uh, um, Abe Sensei, uh, Sasuke Abe Sensei uh, came out from Japan. I was invited to that, um, and uh, um, Matsuoka uh, uh, introduced me to him. And um, we had this uh, wonderful conversation, which culminated in uh, Abe giving me a calligraphy, which uh, I have used mm -hmm. as a central piece of uh, my uh, uh, showman uh, for years. Um, we don't have it at the uh, Heaven and Earth Dojo right now, but uh, um, I was uh, teaching in various places early on here in uh, Virginia, and I displayed that uh, uh, proudly. Um, when I was coming out here, um, I, I had some warning. I knew that I was going to be uh, relocating, 
I wanted to be sure that I didn't wind up picking a place which uh, stomped on anybody's territory. So I looked around at a bunch of dojos on my uh, house shopping visits and business meeting visits and uh, met uh, Bob Galini and I visited over at the uh, Key Society Dojo back in uh, the early 90s uh, when uh, um, Simcox Sensei was, was, was still running it. And uh, I decided uh, that uh, I needed to, to be out here in uh, uh, Western Fairfax. And um, uh, we started uh, as a floating school with the Fairfax County um, as our first step out of the basement. Uh, Neil Cohen, who was, was on, uh, I think I'm sure he's still on, but uh, um, he uh, helped uh, uh, we get started and pick up some additional students, and uh, then uh, we wound up uh, getting a message that we were just too good a school to be a, a county class, and we need to get associated with a brick and mortar uh, housing place, and uh, wound up uh, being recommended to um, uh, Jack Kimball's uh, school, where he, I think. Uh, he was pr principally a Taekwondo instructor, but he uh, was uh, interested in having other martial arts and I think getting some renters of all extra income. And uh, so we were there for some time with, with uh, the One Spirit Martial Arts um, uh, before they uh, uh, decided what well, One Spirit took over the school uh, that Jack Kimball had established. That, that's, that's the way it went. And then they became a uh, sort of a mixed martial arts Muay Thai uh, thing and um, things were kind of uh, spiritually changing in the physical area there and uh, we wound up moving out to action martial arts uh, in, in Ashburn for a number of years. Uh, when that uh, business uh, went south, um, uh, I had this outstanding offer from Brian Erickson sensei uh, to um, uh, throw in with the Heaven and Earth Tocho in uh, uh, Herndon. We did that uh, after the uh, financial collapse of action martial arts. I, I was reluctant to to leave them while they still had a chance of holding it together because you know, they were part of the, of the dues base. But um, it seems that uh, uh, I'm saved by Brian and uh, heaven and earth, of course, at this point. It's like and about how long has that been? How long have I been with Brian? Uh, well, if he's on, he can remind me, but um, I think it's six or seven years now. It's okay, it's fantastic. Starting, starting to pile up time. You know, time flies when you're having a good time. Yeah, <laughs> great. Great, great. Well, thanks for that background. And we look forward to hearing more about um, the style of Aikido that you're currently practicing. Great. Um, Stephen Wolf, Sensei. Oh, good morning, everybody. It's almost time for me to get up. <laughs> I'm on musician time, even though I hardly have any gigs right now because the music business is shut down. Um, well, I did some research when I looked into all this in the history. I'm actually kind of glad I did. Some of it I'd forgotten and some of it I didn't know. But one of the things is, is it all right if I do a screen share? Yeah, I, I think we can give you that possibility. Um, can you try it? Yeah. Yeah, you should. There we go. So you might recognize at least one of these fellows in the picture, uh, which we all have in common. And the other fellow is Koichi Tohei Sensei, which of course is the founder of the Key Society. But at the time this picture was taken, he was yeah, ch chief instructor at Hanbu Dojo. And back in those days, it was just Aikikai, it was Aikikai Aikido. And as you'll hear in a, in a minute, um, our dojo, when it was founded, was Aikikai affiliated as well. And so anyway, I'm going to unshare here. In 1953, Koichi Tohei was invited to go to Hawaii, which was the first time he'd been out. Aikido even had been outside of Japan. 
and Hawaii in particular, as many of you know, has a huge uh, Nisei community, a lot of Japanese Americans. And so it took hold pretty quickly there, and that becomes relevant um, for the second part of this story, which is Simcox Sensei in 1966 was stationed right outside of Tokyo, and he was invited to join a class, and he was one of two Americans in this class. And the sensei there was a board member at Aikikai Dojo. So if any of you have ever visited our dojo, um, when you walk in on the wall on the right is a picture that Simcox took when he was invited to go to Hambu Dojo for this big ceremony demonstration with his sensei. And he took, a, took that picture. Oh, it's a very faded picture now, but it's nice to have it there. Um, so he actually was invited um, to meet O Sensei and Koichi Tohei Sensei and Kishimaru Sensei that day. And so the seeds were planted for what became the Virginia Key Society there. Um, then later, uh, Simcox Sensei was transferred to Hawaii and, and the program was already well entrenched there and he trained there for a while, after which he was sent to Vietnam for a while because he was in the army. And then finally he ended up in DC. And his wife happened to be watching a, a cable news or a cable you know, community channel and saw this demonstration that was coming up with a bunch of heavyweight senseis, which was promoting an Aikido program really close to where they were living at the time. And it turned out to be this program that was starting with Kirk Fowler sensei, who I'm, I was wondering actually, when I heard you said you trained at I, um, New York Aikikai, that's where Kirk Fowler sensei started with Yamada sensei too. And did you actually know him, um, Avi Sensei? I, I didn't know him there, but uh, Dave Sensei, you know, Kurt um, Sensei actually started the defensive tactics program at uh, the Drug Enforcement Agency years yes. ago. And another interesting connection is we've got some O Sensei calligraphy here in our dojo that came from one of the students in Kurt Sensei's dojo in Arizona. So the, oh, okay. the network is pretty amazing. Yeah, he's, he's a chief instructor of the Arizona Key Society now. So anyway, um, Fowler Sensei got transferred to Mexico City. Um, but actually, before that happened, um, Tohei Sensei had been working in the background while still maintaining his, his head instructor status at Aikikai Dojo. And apparently, it was creating some friction. So finally, he just broke off and started the Key Society. So um, also uh, our dojo has been about avoiding politics and starting with the Simcox sensei who was always traveling around and being friends with all the dojos in the area and actually around the country too. So in that spirit, um, and <laughs> I'll just say that's what happened. He started the Key Society in 76 and he sent letters out to a bunch of the senseis that he knew and one of them being Kirk Fowler sensei and, um, inviting them to join the Key Society, and he did. And then he got transferred to Mexico City, and uh, George Simcox took over. And he built the organization into a huge statewide. In fact, we had affiliate dojos in Ohio and Pennsylvania. And I thought the Carolinas, we were trying to remember, I was talking to Marion, who's on with us today. But um, I know it was at least nine or 10 dojos. It was a huge organization. And uh, he passed away in 2000 after bringing us to our current location, which many of you have visited. And a year and a half later, I became head instructor there. Um, so as to my own training, I started as a kid, my, I, you know, like a lot of people in Washington, we've been a, to a lot of places because my father was in the foreign service and he was serving in Brazil. So I started with jujitsu and judo in Brazil as a kid. And when I was about 12 and 13 years old, 14, um, and I always wanted to get back to it as an adult and I did, but by then I was a professional musician and I was spraining my fingers with all the grappling 
and I had matte burn and burnt scrape knuckles and the tops of my feet were always raw and and I'm, this wasn't jiving with my musical career very well and so I, mean, I was reading and I was reading about the spiritual side of Aikido and got interested in it and right about that time I was at my mom's farm in West Virginia and there's this guy that was working at her farm helping her and he knew Zinkat Sensei and he said his number's in the phone book. And so as soon as I got home, I called him up and he's real enthusiastic. I went to the dojo and I've been there ever since. Great. And uh, so he was a major influence, obviously. And he was kind of the spiritual head of our dojo. But there was actually another teacher there, um, Hal Singer, who I learned probably a lot more of my Aikido from than Simcox Sensei. And he had done a lot of training up in New York with M. Izumi Sensei, who was head of the Eastern Tea Society. At the time, there was an Eastern Tea Society. Now, now there's an Eastern Tea Federation under Shainer Sensei, but back then it was M. Izumi Sensei. And he, he also, uh, M. Izumi Sensei, came down to visit us a lot. We got to train with him, and I was going up to New York a lot, so I got to train with him in New York when I was playing. Great. And so... Yeah, Hal Singer, I owe a lot to him. And then I think finally, uh, Kashawaya Sensei, who for a long time was the chief instructor of the United States. And I actually got to travel with him some and be Uchi Desh for him and, and have him wave live swords at me while the audience was gasping. And then one time, a funny story, I was at Towson State University I didn't even know he had a real katana with him. I, I somehow missed that. And then he handed me a boken and he said, attack. And then all of a sudden, here's this live katana. And so I was very precise in my cuts that day. And I hear the sword whizzing by my face while the audience is gasping. But anyway, it was good training. <laughs> and they talk about extending key. And uh, I was doing a lot of it on that particular day. But. Wow, that's exciting. <laughs> But thank yeah, you, thank you, exactly. Steve you, you Sensei, fly, for that. You could fly with it with a katana nowadays. Forget about it. Yeah, thank you for that introduction. Um, Truman Capone Sensei, please. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me, and uh, we've always enjoyed being part of the common ground. Now the virtual common ground, and uh, for over fifty-five years, I've trained. Uh, pretty consistently in the martial arts. And I say that because my initial journey was more external, mainly because I could not find Aikido at a younger age. I grew up in inner city Pittsburgh. And, uh, but the last 30 years have been dedicated more specifically to Aikido. So with that being said, I think, you know, it's good if I go through my training that leads to uh, how we became Kodokan Aikido. Uh, so in 1964, uh, in high school, I was a wrestler and also studied karate. I have old school technology here. So, <laughs> yeah. And uh, at that time, I did a dual study. I mean, I was working in Okinawa Kempo also, and but I liked wrestling, so I wrestled um, throughout high school and lucky enough to win state champion and get a brown belt in uh, Oklahoma Campo. So when I went on scholarship to um, Northern Pennsylvania, again, I could not find Aikido. So I continued my study in the external arts of uh, karate and other things. And then I moved to Blacksburg, Virginia in the seventies. And at that time, no Aikido. <laughs> And so I started teaching with the club here in karate and kept my other training going. But it was around 1980 that I did have the experience of being invited to a Yudansha camp in Norfolk. And I don't know if people are familiar with uh, the Xi'an um, Hamada at that time. And I went to quite a few of these camps and he was uh, introducing Aikido. And that was my first real exposure to a little bit of judo too. And it was external, but he did have a, a philosophy that I really uh, liked. 
So with that, um, I came back, but my injuries at that level from the external training were more than I expected. I was doing some full contact then. Why? Don't ask me. I was overly competitive, overly yanged. Uh, and so that led me to softer art. I had to heal up some injuries. And so I got into more uh, Tai Chi, Qi Kung type things. And for about five years, uh, under people like Vince Black, who uh, was in the Blacksburg area occasionally, uh, introduced some Shini and some Qi Kung and other Tai Chi things from other instructors in yoga. Until uh, about 1987, I was in the War Memorial Gym at Virginia Tech where our dojo is. And I ended up seeing a young man with his wife's training. And some of you might remember uh, this gentleman, C.B. Claiborne. C.B. Claiborne uh, was also a big participant with the Key Society and uh, taught at JMU for a period of time. C.B. and I, uh, at that time, I said, what are you doing? And he said, well, we're just practicing Aikido. And I said, do you mind if I work out with you? So for about a year or two, we did a small group of Aikido. At that time, around 1988, CB told me that he trained in Greensboro, Tamiki style. He was a brown belt at that time. And um, he also trained with John Grinnell Sensei. And John Grinnell uh, Sensei uh, came back from Japan with his wife, Betsy, uh, and they basically uh, both had their knee dons and decided they were going to start the Kodokan Aikido group down in Greensboro. And that Tanaka Shion at that time uh, granted them the license with the Japanese uh, Aikikai Federation. Now, Tanaka Shion has a lineage uh, of its own. Uh, Tanaka actually, uh, his father, uh, just show the image, okay. On the left here is Tanaka's father and Tanaka Shion, uh, right here. We're a family of Aikido and uh, in Okasaki, Japan, uh, they uh, affiliated the first school and he has over uh, in 93, five other schools in Japan, in uh, Aichi, Toyota, Anju, Kota. And then uh, he wanted to develop the schools in uh, the USA. So we became one of the affiliates of that. We actually became the uh, sister school of Greensboro. And that was in 1988. Uh, 89 and then CB at that time was the head instructor and uh, he moved on to James Madison and opened up a set, another Kodagon school there and I was <laughs> more like a field promotion in the army. They asked me to take over in around 92, 93. So that's been quite a while, 30 years of that. But over that time, like V Sensei said, many of our students, we were always considered the boot camp. We would train kids for four years and they would uh, go to Northern Virginia, Fredericksburg and California, all over. So I've always found that to be a good thing. So we were always trained hard in the basics. Uh, but also we realized during that time that we needed to collaborate and affiliate uh, throughout those 30 some years. So we did partnership up and in those days, uh, as you can see, in the 90s, mid-90s, we did a lot of the Iwama with Saito Sensei. And so when he would come to Charlottesville, um, we went to all the workshop. And there was one image here where he's giving me instruction of uh, how to use the gel, which I needed, I still need. Um, and uh, also with the uh, Key Society, uh, George Simcock would come to Blacksburg. And we have many, many uh, workshops back in those days of that. And then Pat Hendricks would, would go to her workshop with Yvonne. And so we tried to keep that uh, going with Sarantino, everybody, as much as we could. 
and we needed it because we are uh, remote. And Tanaka, fortunately enough, every year from 1988, uh, him and uh, he would always bring two or three instructors. And usually in May, June, or July, and we would go for a week down in Greensboro, or they would come to Blacksburg, and we would hold these intensive seminars. And Tanaka was always really good about sharing all his uh, lineage and techniques. And Great. both of them were uh, a story before I end up here. Um, Tanaka, she and father, and Osensei were as actually part of the, uh, you know, a religious sect, the uh, Omote Kyote sect, and they were um, actually friends and trained together. And Tanaka tells the story of how, you know, Osensei would come to his house in Okasaki and they would train upstairs. They had the dojo above the house and how at the age of 10 and 12, uh, he would be thrown by both his father and Osensei. And uh, so that lineage goes back and it was actually granted, uh, you know, in 1957, the actual Kodokan uh, name uh, in 1957, was granted by Osensei to Tanaka as uh, Okay, father. interesting. Yeah, and so we find that always interesting. But anyway, uh, to summarize, um, you know, in the past, I think of what's going on now with the, uh, but we used to always have, our enrollments have been, you know, in the early 90s and up to 2000, we had uh, usually big groups of 30, 40 people at time, 50. Over the years, it's tapered in the 2000s and 2000s. You know, especially now, we uh, first time we've had, ever had to re really pull back. We have been doing some virtual and other things. But I'll let that go for the other discussion. But that's my um, kind of overview of how we became Kodakon Aikido of Blacksburg, Virginia Tech, sometimes we're called. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Truman Sensei. Uh, our next speaker is Yvonne Sensei. Okay, well, the 10 second version is I started in the 80s in Aikido Arlington, and there I am still. <laughs> I'll go deeper than that. <laughs> I started training with Donnie Lyon in the 80s. Um, his first teacher was Gordon Sakamoto Shihan, who unfortunately uh, wasn't able to make it today. And then he went from there with Clyde Takahuchi Shihan, both of which are Aikikai. Um, actually, it was Clyde Shihan who recommended that he go to Iwama. So I think it was in the early 80s. He did go to Iwama the first time he stayed for a year as Uchideshi, and then he continued um, and went back several times after that. Um, and when he came back, I guess he did decide to open his dojo, and that was Aikido of Arlington. And my late husband, Casey, and I were his first students. The first year, we actually were in a gym in Skyline, and then we moved to the church where we are today. Again, we don't have a whole lot of moving around. <laughs> we kind of got to one place, and we've been at church for over 30 years now. Um, and it was kind of funny because we went to at the, the gym where they had a sign up that said a keto class is starting. I, I didn't even know what it was. Casey at least had the knowledge and knew a little bit about that. He knew at least it was a martial art. He knew a little bit about it. But we both went and just fell in love with it. Again, like uh, Aviv Sensei mentioned earlier, I just think I really like, uh, I'm an engineer, so I like the precision of it. I like the, I like the, the breathing. I like the settling. Um, it just all aspects of it really spoke to me. We were training six days a week back then. Um, Donnie passed away in 96 and he left me the dojo. And towards the end of his life, we had several discussions on, you know, what we're going to do about the, the dojo, how we would continue it on. I had a really demanding job at the time, I was traveling a fair amount. Um, I actually you all pulled a picture, so I went and I got a picture. So this is Donnie and both Darius and he's throwing Paul, who are also two of the senior students at the time. We kind of went up the ranks together. Um, so anyway, so I told him at the time, I said, well, I'm not really sure if I can. I said, but I'll tell you what, I'll give you, I'll give it my all for the first year and we'll kind of see what happens. He just kind of smiled. You know, I guess he kind of knew he had, I guess, more faith in me than I had in myself and in the dojo. And here we are 25 years later since I've been there and we're still, not to say going strong, but we're, st we're still going. Um, and I guess I mentioned he'd gone to Iwama several times. I guess his last trip was in 91. And I went with them along with uh, Darius and Paul and a couple of other, the Enright brothers. Um, we all went along and stayed for five weeks. 
and not considered to be a Saito groupie. I went to Denmark for a week long summer camp um, one time. I've you know, traveled around the country. If he's in Colorado, I was in Colorado. If he's in Florida, go to Florida, California, the whole nine yards. But I didn't limit myself just to um, Iwama. I guess I was kind of what you'd call a seminar whore. <laughs> I'd kind of go wherever the seminars were, I'd go. In Kapalaki Kai at seminars, I'd, I'd go just by all of theirs. Like Sorrentino would have a lot of seminars, I'd go there. I'd travel all around and kind of, I'd, I was just, I was hooked on it. You know, I just couldn't get enough. Um, anyway, I guess that's in a nutshell. I don't have quite the roaming around the world as a lot of you did. Um, I kind of came here in Arlington. I've stayed in Arlington, and, but I do still like getting around and seeing the styles. I and mean, we, we were flooded out in July and Steve Wolf was gracious enough to let me train there. And our guys kind of went to several different places and trained around. Um, so it's been good. Um, you know, like I say, I mean, good Aikido is good Aikido. I'm just very fortunate that here in Virginia, we have such good Aikido. Um, not just technically, but just as far as the community itself goes, as Aviv mentioned, the family that we have. I mean, it is just one big family. So um, I'm very, very grateful to everybody. Yeah, thank you, Yvonne Sensei. Um, I'd like to welcome Brian Erickson Sensei to the panel. Brian is the chief instructor at Heaven and Earth Aikido in Herndon. And Brian Sensei, if you take um, you know, three to five minutes and tell us a little bit about uh, your background, how uh, your dojo got there, but also what do you wish people would know about your style of Aikido? What are the gems there that uh, everybody should know about? Okay, well, thank you all. Uh, I'm doing double duty this morning with uh, some childcare as well. So if you hear some noises in the background, uh, that's a little guy running around there. Uh, yeah, we are just outside Dulles Airport here. And um, I started uh, um, I started Aikido originally um, in 1989. I started with a Tamigi group. Um, and in, in a way, it goes a bit past that because um, my first memories were in Japan, uh, Hokkaido. Um, specifically, um, I'm, I'm, my father was in the military, and ever since I was a kid, he told me about Aikido, um, and he wanted me to find a place and practice. Actually, when I was in about eighth grade, we went up to um, we went up Satome Satsai's dojo, and I watched a test up there, um, and was mightily bored with it, to be frank. Um, didn't completely understand dad's attraction to it, but um, I came back from having gone into the military after high school. I spent a little bit of time with, as an army ranger, um, local SF group as well. And I came back and my dad had found this unusual thing that he'd always told me about. Um, so I, I started practicing it um, with this Tamiki group and something clicked. Um, when I started my university in Santa Fe, New Mexico, um, I, uh, there was an Aikikai group that was there under Chiba Sensei, and uh, quite a bit different. Um, and I spent a summer with Chiba Sensei um, as Uchideshi. Um, and then uh, I, through circumstance, I guess, I was in New York. And uh, so, and ran into New York Aikikai and uh, drew an attraction there. So I spent almost three years there as Uchideshi under Yamada Sensei. Um, Yamada Sensei, our lineage descends through Yamada Sensei, but I had a very strong connection, a very powerful connection with um, the number two teacher, Tsugano. Uh, he almost became a second father to me. Um, so um, I left there in uh, 86 um, and I uh, moved down here to the DC area. Um, I continued, uh, I finished out my schooling down here um, and then returned to New York um, where I continued on for a period of time until I was in New York for September 11th. Um, 
So when I saw everything that had occurred, um, I spent two days down at ground zero uh, working down there. Um, I uh, signed up for the military again. At that point, I'd been out for a number of years, but like a lot of prior service, I signed back in on the reserves and got pulled into the war. Um, I spent five and a half years overseas between Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, Aikido was a tremendously important thing for me in terms of stabilizing myself through some of the difficulties. Um, I was not someone who was uh, much inside of the bases. Um, my mission took me forward on, on, on quite a lot of occasions. And uh, so Aikido was, was something through all of the dangers that I faced, uh, the bombings and, and various things that was important. So when I returned from Afghanistan, um, I decided to start, start a dojo. Um, in order to, at that point, um, my mentor, Suganam, had passed on. Oh, um, and uh, there were some unique ideas that he passed down to me uh, that he received. Uh, particularly, particularly with, with weapons um, and also some of the things that I'd learned overseas um, with doing my practice and uh, that in, in applying it to life. So uh, we've been here now about seven years and uh, we uh, just celebrated um, every year in, in August, we do a memorial seminar for Sugano where we reaffirm on some of his ideas that he passed down. Um, everybody was showing pictures. Unfortunately, I'm, I, the best that I can do is, uh, is showing this where Sugana was, <laughs> was throwing me. We made up a poster that we put it out on Facebook. So Sugana was throwing me in, in uh, 97 when I left being Uchidashi there in New York. Um, and uh, so we've been here about seven years and uh, our mission is to continue on ideas of, of the founder um, through that I received through Yamada, uh, but particularly Sugano. So, Perfect. Uh, Perfect. Brian Sensei, would you mind reading what's on that, um, that screensaver, that quote there from Sugano Sensei? Yes. Aikido is love. One must act on these ideas. One must help others. One must assist others around. So this is a central and core founding idea of the dojo. Um, so, and we've, we've tried to continue this, this forward by a regular part of, of what we do. I think it's uh, tremendously important that First of all, as, as I tell students, I, I, you know, is is not about um, is not about fighting. Is not about um, is uh, is not about aggression towards others. But you have to be able to use your Aikido physically to defend yourself, to defend others. But the larger intention of the art is exactly as Sugano says to um, to assist others to make a better world. Great. So in terms of that, we try to do several times a year, we try to do charity things, try to work in our small area around here, make a difference. Great, perfect, yeah. So it's interesting hearing everybody's story that there are decades of Aikido and you know dozens of dojos and so many different lineages, which all in some way work back to O-sensei and uh, for round two here, we'll go through um, alphabetically by last name. And uh, before we do that, before I pose the next question, I just want to let, um, let the people who are participating to know that if you have any questions, you can type them in the chat and uh, we'll try to get to them uh, after the next round. And, and basically what I'm asking the senseis here now is, You've heard um, everybody's introduction. You've shared a bit about your history. 
Can you summarize for us, you know, I don't want to say the secret of, of your Aikido. Uh, I did, you're not going to give that away here today. I know we've got to come and train with you to get that, but summarize uh, what, what you really think people need to know uh, to understand your Aikido, your school's Aikido. Truman Sensei? Yes, uh, good question. Um, in our philosophy, uh, specifically from the Kodokan Aikido and Tanaka Shien and what he's handled in our practice, I think a big part of it is healing, relaxation, uh, and the whole philosophy of Masugi, the cleansing uh, of oneself through practice. Uh, so each practice, Masugi is a key essential, as well as Zanshin, a focus, direct focus on what we're doing, task at hand, that it has to be good posture, uh, good breathing, and those aspects of being, again, very circular and soft at times, but not overly using aggression or muscle, are a, a big factor in our training, but also the community aspect of as individuals within the dojo and leaving uh, in a good uh, sense. And you know, I always quote um, the book Miss Miss You Know Mastery by um, Leonard that uh, when you leave at night after a practice, we always want to feel better. So that's uh, in a nutshell. I would say uh, that whole energy practice is uh, very important. Technique comes, I've never been a big, I mean, I love technique, but uh, after a while, it's more about the positioning, the space, the place. And that's where I would say uh, Kodakon uh, would focus on. Oh, fantastic, interesting. Stephen Gare Sensei. Yeah, <clears throat> for me, uh, Aikido is uh, the way of Aiki. And if you uh, go out on the internet and look at all the different discussions about Aiki, you see that uh, there's a lot of different um, uh, notions of what aspect of Aiki or what particular usage of that term that Osensei had used is the one that motivates people. For me, it's the Aiki is that largely mind-body interpersonal relationship that kind of begins with Tohei's uh, teaching to lead the mind. Um, I think of it more like mental kazushi. Uh, methods that lead to the Aikido experience uh, include uh, properly executed atemi, um, confidence manipulation, which is a real complex uh, uh, body language interaction, um, uh, visceral key centering communication through subconscious channels. And uh, I, I've thought that maybe uh, if we had been in person, I would have tried to get some of that across uh, to, to, to the people because uh, it, it's the stuff that looks like woo-woo stuff when you see it, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, it's the experience you got to have. Um, in terms of uh, ukemi, my, my uh, feeling about uh, ukemi uh, and, and the role of an uke is a little bit uh, maybe um, out of the mainstream. I, I don't think it's really about taking falls. If you look up the word uke today, uh, you can see that the contemporary meaning in Japan is a little bit shocking. Um, uh, for me, the, the, the purpose of that uke is to bring the aggressive energy for the training of uh, Aiki. And that the purpose of the Aikido would be the transformation of aggression to cooperation. Why does it look like it's fake? It's not looking fake. It can't be good. Now, it could be fake still, but good Aikido is going to look fake because the aggression has been converted to cooperation. Um, I'm not real comfortable uh, focusing so much on Katate Dori techniques. Uh, I think it's um, an extremely unlikely attack, and it's also, in my opinion, kind of uh, uh, difficult to practice the harmonizing with aggressive energy when that, that, that's the initial contact, particularly since um, pretty much the nage has to initiate in order to, to get that going. Um, so there's this uh, 
tension in is is, is Aikido defensive or not? The whole uh, story of uh, uh, go no sen, sen no sen, sen sen no sen. Uh, to me, those all merge, and uh, uh, we believe that Aikido is more in the Takemuso Aiki and the Nizo no Kokoro. It's that spontaneous development. Uh, technical vocabulary, in, in my opinion, is not part of what defines Aikido. And uh, when people talk about Aikido techniques, I, I, I retranslate to myself, those are techniques that get used in Jojo training where we're, we're training Aiki. Uh, uh, I think of uh, a, a statement that the founder made, the techniques of the way of peace change constantly. Every encounter is unique and the appropriate response should emerge naturally. Today's techniques will be different tomorrow. Do not get caught up with the form and appearance of a challenge. The art of peace has no form. It is a study of the spirit. So that mm. is kind of at mm. the, the center. And so uh, uh, Yoko Minuchi, Shionaki, things of these natures, that the, these are um, nothing more than uh, training tools. They, they are not uh, in any way the essence of, of Aikido. The most important thing is that they provide a common vocabulary so that when uh, we come together in these situations, at least uh, we don't have to spend a whole lot of time just trying to teach each other vocabulary. Yeah, and so that, that's the rule. Um, I feel that um, this uh, go no sen, sen no sen idea, um, it's, we don't want to be the aggressors. So the idea that uh, one might uh, attack first when they feel like uh, uh, an attack is coming to, to be preemptive, um, that will be seen as having started the fight, so to speak. <clears throat> and I don't think that uh, either in a physical confrontation or in a communication, uh, emotional uh, con uh, connection, that, 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 that's sound. However, I do believe that uh, something that um, allows you to uh, take the initiative once something has happened, since the aggression has been brought, that that's important. That's what the Aikido is. And lastly, I've put on there that um, I can't teach anybody Aikido. And the best I can do is strive to provide an environment where students can discover for themselves. And so I, I see that as discovery. And um, I believe that with you, Aviv, have done um, with building that magnificent dojo and creating the common ground uh, as a uh, channel for us to routinely come back together from our different geographical places and with our different emphasis on uh, elements of Aikido is uh, it, it's, it's really the uh, it's the lifeblood of what's going to keep us alive which you've done thank you mm, no thank you thank you Gary sensei it's really interesting that you mentioned uh, Takemusu Aikido um, the founder uh, talked about Takemusu Aiki being the highest form of Aikido practice. And uh, we, our dojo is part of the Takemusu Aikido Association, and we have the founder's own calligraphy that says Takemusu, uh, that fills energy into our showman. Uh, but yet in our style of training, it's sort of like the gates that you have to go through. There's Katai Keiko static practice, there's Yawarakai Keiko, flexible practice, there's Kino Nagare, um, flowing energy, and then maybe you get to Takemusu Aiki. So we focus a lot in Iwama style Aikido on the fundamentals. And um, I like to say that there are three distinguishing characteristics of Iwama style Aikido. One is that we do spend a lot of time on static practice. And I think it's very helpful to let people know what is their left and right foot and how do things feel when somebody is really grabbing you hard and how do you develop a sense of, uh, of relaxed confidence. What was the phrase that um, Truman Sensei used? Confidence manipulation. I love that. I've never heard that before. So we, we do a lot of static practice. We also use weapons. A lot. We practice with the Boken and the Joe, which has turned out to be a godsend um, during this uh, pandemic because I haven't had to create new curriculum. We have it. 
And here in our dojo, we alternate one month Boken, one month Joe. And uh, there's a lot of curriculum, some of which came directly from O-sensei. Uh, and uh, the rest is distillations of O-sensei's teachings from Saito Mora Hiro Shihan. And, um, and in fact, I'm certified by Saito Sensei to teach some of that stuff. And the third thing that distinguishes us, uh, our style of training, is we use ki. Now, that's a detriment in this pandemic because you don't want to be projecting. Uh, so uh, we've had, we do have one class a week right now in the dojo for family members. They're allowed to train together. We are still wearing masks, but we're not doing ki. And it's so hard for me because after these decades of doing it, to not do the ki. Um, but uh, that shout is really uh, an important part of the practice. And O-sensei said to Saito Shihan when he was young in his training, when your ki can knock the sparrow off the tree, then, then you really got it. Then you got big energy and that's what we were all working towards. And we get there through static practice, the practice with weapons and, uh, and through the ki. And so I think those are the distinguishing things about uh, Iwama style Aikido from my perspective. Uh, Dave McConnell, Sensei. Uh, thank you very much, Abhi Sensei. Um, just to kind of very quickly touch on something that you had mentioned in the beginning, the common ground connection and how we're kind of all connected here. Um, I mentioned the connection with John Driscoll Sensei and Yvonne uh, Sensei's dojo over the years and yourself uh, with John Driscoll Sensei over the years. Um, also, last year, I, I, re I returned to the States in January 2019. And fortunately, uh, last summer in August, we were able to host um, the first annual Nishio Aikido Keiko Kai of Northern Virginia seminar with uh, Arisue, uh, Takeo Arisue Sensei and Kaizuwa Nakamichi Sensei, my sensei is from Japan. And uh, we were hoping to have a second one this year, but due to the pandemic, that didn't happen. However, a view sensei was nice enough to allow us to host the event at Aikido in Fredericksburg, which is a beautiful setting. So I just wanted to relate a very short story here um, about the connection uh, that I, I should have mentioned earlier. Um, during that seminar, uh, when they first, when I resway and Nakamichi Sensei walked into the dojo. One, it's a beautiful setting, right? It's a gorgeous dojo, it's, it's beautiful. You walk in there and you feel like you're at Iwama, it's beautiful. They, they look to the showman and they see O-sensei's photo and they also see Saito-sensei's photo. <laughs> so during the seminar, Risue is in his opening addresses the people that were in attendance. We had about a hundred people attend perhaps. Anyways, he mentions that when he first walked into the dojo after meeting a Risway sensei, I mean, after meet, meeting a view sensei outside, he walks into the dojo and the very first thing that his eyes went to naturally was the photo of Saito sensei on the wall on, on the showman. And he said when he was in, uh, when he was in college in the university in Japan, uh, Saito sensei was, he studied with him at Iwama. It was his sensei for a number of years. And he said he got these chills down his spine because he went back to when he was 18 or 19 years old and Saito sensei was constantly, you know, reprimanding him on the mat about his technique or, or whatnot. So I thought that was a very uh, interesting connection. And I think that really connected with uh, the Risue and Nakamichi sensei who you know, came from Japan to put the seminar on here for us in Virginia, that here in Virginia, there's such close connections, you know, kind of to the roots of, of Aikido through everyone that's present here. So I thought that was uh, important to mention as far as what kind of defines Nishio's, uh, we, it's Aikido, right? Nishio Sensei was Shihan with Hombu. Uh, he was one of the post-war greats. He was also very close friends with Saito Sensei um, throughout his, his lifetime. Uh, my teacher, Risue Sensei, was uh, one of his direct students for 35 plus years prior to him passing away, unfortunately, in 2005. And it's through him and Tony 
Tartaglia Sensei that I've been fortunate enough to walk this path today. So, uh, Dave, uh, Dave Sensei, maybe maybe you could mention a little bit, um, just briefly, about the EI aspect of your training because I do yeah, think I, it's a core thing. Yes, sir. I was going to get into that as we go on here, right next, actually. So I made a couple of notes here about kind of what what characterizes Aikido in the Nishio Sensei tradition. Uh, Nishio Sensei was a uh, he had a massive background. And when you talk to his direct students in Japan, um, all of them are, they're nothing but reverent uh, about him due to his martial prowess and his ability. He was uh, high ranked in judo, maybe fifth on, I believe, he was fifth on in, in uh, Japanese karate. He was seventh on in, uh, in EI, and he also studied uh, judo as well. And what he did was he incorporated all those aspects into his Aikido. And what, what, what the idea behind the Nishio tradition is that there has to be a relevance of Budo and a martial foundation in martial effectiveness um, in, in your Aikido practice, right? Like uh, previously we discussed here, right? It, I think uh, Brian Sensei said it very well, your Aikido has to work, it has to be effective. However, there's a moral foundation to Aikido, which is really important, right? If you look at MMA, and I'm not trying to be disparaging about that, it's great sport, but you know, they get on the mat, they slap each other's hands and they pound each other in the face and whoever gets, you know, wins, whatever. That, that's not what we do, right? What we do is based on a moral foundation. However, it's a based on a moral foundation through giving the opponent, accepting the, the, the opponents, getting, convincing them that what they're doing is wrong. And Nishio Sensei was very big on teaching a uh, whole separate uh, Iaido system called Aiki Toho Iai. And in that he took 15 kata from Koru and actually 20 kata from Koru. And he formed a EI system to be taught in conjunction with Aikido. It's not done under Aikikai, it's a totally separate system, but it basically is the foundation for what we are doing with our empty hand uh, movement and our Kentai Ken and Kentai Jo uh, sets that we do, right? So one of the biggest principles of anyone who's studied EI is, is Katsujin Ken, right? Life-giving sword, right? And what, what does that mean? That means as I'm drawn up into Jodan and I'm getting ready to engage the opponent, right? The moral thing to do is to give them an opportunity to disengage from you, right? Yeah. And that's this principle of Yurusu or acceptance. So how he defines that or how he explains that in a physical sense is through not so much in technique, the techniques are there, it's through martial principle that is focused on, right? The biggest principle, uh, the first principle is the use of a Rimi, either stepping into or stepping around the opponent's center and positioning yourself at the Shizaku where you can strike them, they can't strike you. Very effective use of a Teme. Um, the first time I was in the dojo in Japan and uh, in our very first trip there, I don't know, 16, 17 years ago, um, the very first class that I attended was, I was amazed by uh, not only how effective their Ateme was, but just how fast and effective their technique was, right? I, I'd never seen anything like that. Um, and then the other one is affecting Kazushi. All three of those come into play. The use of Arimi, effective Ateme, re really bring about the use of Kazushi. Yeah. And at that point, you apply Arima Nage or Shio Nage or Kodagash, whatever the Nage was it is to convince the opponent to disengage with you as he's laying on the mat and he's gently pinned. Okay. Yeah. That so, Kazushi taking that Kazushi taking is, is a really common element across uh, across all styles. Yeah, and yes, and if you would. if you watch any O Sensei videos, uh, he's not letting the uh, the attacker take the advantage. He's always keeping the uh, attacker off balance so that he can um, you know, do what he wants to do. It's very interesting. 
Yes. So um, Nisho Sensei, when he would explain it, and Ariswa Sensei, what they would say is that the the the, the uh, engagement should be decided before the first movement, and that comes into what uh, Gayer Sensei was talking about, Sen no Sen go no Sen, right? And to me, it kind of does. They kind of do lump together, just like Gayer Sensei said. It's that anticipation of what the opponent's going to do, right? How am I going to read that? How am I effectively um, how am I effectively going to uh, to advance, conduct these uh, techniques, and throw the opponent here before yeah. he has a chance to react on, uh, on me? Yeah. And then the other, yes, sir. So um, that, that's good background, Dave. Um, maybe we'll come back to you uh, if we have some more time. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and our next speaker will be Steve Wolf Sensei. What about T? Sorry? <laughs> what about T? What about T? T comes before W. Our next speaker will be Yvonne Telwell Sensei. I didn't know if it was some, you know, foreign way of doing things, but anyway, yeah. So as if, I guess because Aviv probably said most of what I was gonna say. Basically in Iwama, we have like three big components are the style as far as doing the stop start, moving on to Was Kinogari, then on to Wase Takebusu. Um, the second one that he mentioned was what a strong emphasis we have on the weapons. I wanna say that we started back in, I guess it was in May, late May. And till now we've just been doing Joe. So we haven't even advanced to Ken yet. We've had, I mean, the repertoire is just huge of the stuff that we have with the weapons. So it really has been nice that we've really been able to go deep, deep, deep into the weapons. Um, the third thing was the key eyes. Um, so I just want to go a little deeper then to some of those things is as far as with Saito Sensei, I think one thing that he was really brilliant at was, in addition to, of course, having amazing Aikido, was that he taught people how to teach. Being an engineer, I really appreciated his systematic way of, of, of doing progressions with each class, whether it's taking a single technique and showing a lot of different um, attacks with that single technique, or on the other hand, sticking with a, an attack and showing a lot of different ways that progressions go on to the various techniques. And that's something that really spoke to me as a good way of really um, just showing how similar all these things are. Um, you know, everything is really just a, a continuation of the previous one. Um, a little more philosophically, I think, as far as with the keto is I think in this time when things are so divisive that I think, I mean, when we have these Zoom classes now, uh, Hendrix does these Zoom classes, I mean, the people from all over the world that are coming in. So I think it's a really nice way of kind of bringing everybody together and having some sort of common ground, I think that we all can appreciate um, and do. I just think that's, that's really important to realize that, you know, we're all the same. We all want the same things in life. Um, Akita is just one way of helping bring that together. Great. Great. Thank you. Uh, Steve Wolf Sensei. Um, one thing that strikes me listening to all of you, and I'm glad I got to hear all of you first, is how much we're saying the same thing, but each in our own way. Um, and for example, I'm gonna, I will pick two items from. Uh, something called the Shokushu, which is a book of sayings by Tohei Sensei. Now, the first one is motto. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but let us have universal spirit that loves and protects all of creation and helps all things grow and develop. To unify mind and body and become one with the universe is the ultimate purpose of our study. So, and here's another one. Reisei Shin, the universal mind, what it means. Uh, Tohei Sensei, borrowed a lot of obscure Buddhist terms. So for those of you who know Japanese, you might not recognize that word, but it means universal mind, Reisei Shin. Human beings are blessed with a mind that is directly connected to the mind of the universe. This is known as Reisei Shin. The moon is clearly reflected in the water when the water is calm. In the same way, when our mind and body are unified and calm, our race sheen manifests itself completely. Once this happens, all suffering and wicked desires fall away, and the universal mind of love and protection for all things appears in us. Let us strive to realize our race sheen. 
So there's an interesting book on my screen share just for a second. Um, where to go here? So this book, some of you may have seen it. And Simcox Sensei has a chapter in there because he was pretty active in the 80s and 90s and had a lot of influence. And it's the longest interview that I've seen uh, from Simcox Sensei. So if you get a chance, I saw some used copies the other day on Amazon. You might want to pick this up because Kobayashi Sensei, there's a lot of different senseis that were prominent in those early years in this book. You can probably find a lot of interesting reading here. So um, this, this is some stuff that I was reading from that interview. And that one, one that's really interesting is that he, since Simcox Sensei thought that Tohei's teaching methods evolved as a result of being exposed to Americans, where they did something that you never do in Japan, which is they asked why. Because <laughs> in some dojos, that would be an insult. <laughs> so, um, so Tohei Sensei began to explore methods and means and developed a whole um, pedagogy around trying to explain what he saw O Sensei doing and what he saw as the important points of how to unify mind and body and how to test for that to see if your mind and body is unified. Um, so one, one example, if you guys are interested, if you visit our dojo, Northern Virginia Ki Aikido, by the way, is what we're called these days. Um, that we're still in the background where Virginia Ki Society were incorporated as that. But if you go to the Northern Virginia Ki Aikido Facebook page, there's a video in there of Toei Sensei's son, not Shinichi Sensei, teaching one of our members, Ki. And it's really interesting to watch it's like the guy he's trying to teach is going e -e 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 <laughs> like that, and and uh, Shinichi is e -e 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 you know, and it's huge, and the whole walls are shaking, and it's an interesting study. And what they're really saying is that it's a reflection of your state of mind and the state of relaxation in your body, so that everything that we do is that. So even though we have all these so-called key exercises. Um, they're really just a way to physically test to see if you're really doing that. And ultimately, you take that into the Aikido practice. Are you really relaxed? But having said that, and having trained uh, with a number of you, um, especially Del Well Sensei recently, it was fun having her at the dojo, even though it was sad the reason why. <laughs> we had a great time training together there with her students and herself. And, and also with uh, Goldsmith Sensei's senior students that have had the opportunity. And it feels the same when you're thrown by really good people. In the end, it feels like being thrown by the best key society people. Um, it's soft, you're not quite sure how you got led to the floor. Um, and I think in the, in the end, we want, we all want the same thing. We're all trying to get to that place where our Aikido reflects that. But also, as you see from Tohei Sensei's sayings in the beginning of this, um, that we can take it into daily life and maybe have a po positive impact on the planet. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. That's fantastic. Um, before we go to questions from the floor, uh, do any instructors want to follow up with any other instructors? Are there any questions? If you don't mind, it'd be essentially just a, a, a minute or two. Um, the, with the Nishio tradition of Aikido, there's a set of Toho Ii. There's 20 kata taken out of Koru with the sword. And the way, technically, the way the system is taught is the the Aikido techniques are introduced first through the Ii Kata, the sword Kata. For example, uh, Uge Nagashi relates to Ikkyo, okay? Um, Suka Osei relates to uh, Nikkyo. So we practice the Ii Kata first, then we practice the uh, empty hand technique to see the relationship and the relevance of the movement of the sword it's not so much a sword, it's a movement of the body with the sword. 
and then we practice the Kentai Ken Kentai Jo Kumitach sets, which closely parallel or correlate with the EI and the empty hand sets. Mm -hmm. So that's basically from a technical standpoint, that's how that's how it's approached, which is a little bit different uh, maybe than some other people would practice. So there's a heavy uh, emphasis on uh, EIDO, but what you're doing in the EIDO in relationship to your body movement, the empty hand technique and how that correlates with the movement when you're doing the sorkata, and then the Kentai Ken, Kentai Joe sets. So uh, thank you very much. Yeah, interesting. To me, it's, it's fascinating how the different lineages that descend from the founder <clears throat> have such very different interpretations. Uh, Sugano Sensei was very specific in saying that we should never do anything that approaches Iaido because you are never supposed to let anybody in that close that you have to, that you have to cut and drive the person off from being immediately in front of you. You should be able to recognize when there's a threat that's coming in, draw your weapon, and then uh, handle things appropriately. Um, so um, to go for the, the three things that, are, that we have as far as a, a dojo that are maybe different than, than other lineages, we start from the Aikido moral code that we receive from Sugano. Um, we say this with every, with every class. Um, Aikido is a way, there is commitment and there is obligation. Do not abuse or misuse the art of Aikido. Study carefully, honestly, and humbly. Respect your seniors, take care of your juniors. So he left that to us and to other schools that, uh, that, that follow him. Uh, the other thing is we have a, so um, Sugano received his weapons exclusively through the founder. He was Otomo for the founder. He also spent a little bit of time in Iwama, I believe. Um, but he, all of the, the weapons that I have seen thus far are very different than, than Iwama. Um, and we, we don't hold the Ken forward. We have a defensive posture where the Kasaki is, is off the line up here and you're standing behind, um, behind the Volken. Um, the, uh, and then we have a, a separate set of uh, Joe Kata that we also use that are different than everything that I've, I've seen in, in other style. Um, the other thing is that, that I stress for again, for everyone who comes into the dojo, is that this is an art that has to be used practically. So I have used it um, in, in situations where I've needed to. And we can have many good ideas about assisting and helping the world. But if you cannot physically use this art to defend yourself and defend others, then it's a, simply a lot of talk. Can I throw a piece in here? Um, I was reading this thing called 10 Questions for the Dalai Lama. And one of the questions they asked him, and I think he's arguably the most peaceful person on the planet, or at least among those. Um, he was asked, you know, what would you do if you were attacked in an alley by yourself and your life was in danger? And he said, I would defend myself so I can give my life something worth dying for. And I just love that. And all of a sudden, you know, it just codified, I think, what we try to do as Aikidoists as well. Yeah, interesting. So uh, Aikido is sometimes called the art of peace. Um, uh, we've got one more question for the group. Looking forward, what's the future of Aikido in your dojo in Virginia? And how do you manifest the art of peace in your practice? And we'll just let whoever wants to talk first go first and speak over each other. But you only get a couple minutes, sorry. Well, I'll go ahead and give a post-COVID answer. 
it's up in the air. <laughs> who knows? You know, like just like with everything else, I think that we have right now, it's who really knows what's going on until we really get a safe vaccine. Um, I mean, I right now it's been. I mean, timing wise, was perfect, and we were able to train outside throughout the summer. Um, the days are longer. You know, a few months that's going to change. Are we going to be able to go inside? Are we going to be able to keep people's interest enough? I mean, weapons are great. I mean. Another year from now, where people are going to want to be enthusiastic about coming every single day to continue with the weapons. I mean, there's a lot of things to struggle with. Um, but I think just with the root of the keto, I mean, I mentioned earlier, I think it's something that we really need now, I think more than ever, of we need this togetherness. We, we, all this isolation is horrible in so many ways. I think we really need this strong community that this keto brings. Um, so I think we're all fortunate that we do have something like this that we do have. And we're not completely isolated like some like some people are. I think so. I think long term, Makito is going to have not a problem. I think we're going to continue to thrive and we're going to continue to do well. But in the short term, I think it's going to be a struggle. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to augment uh, Yvonne Sensei too. Uh, you know, one of uh, O Sensei's favorite sayings was "Practice with fierce joy, relax." Be patient with yourself and train hard. And I always found that to be very uh, encompassing, yin yang in that sense. Because, you know, you do want to uh, come into this at a, I don't know, I'm looking at it in the future, like as uh, with what's going on and how we are in a hiatus, which has given us some uh, creative uh, ways to think of things. The virtual classes were a good example it made me personally uh, more creative in a, an attempt to project that, uh, probably more than on the mat in some respect. But it was also very, it's also has a, another side to it that's very straining and uh, mentally uh, has issue. But I think we have to come in to the future with a new visual branding. I think Aikido, for most of us who have been doing it, it's since, you know, for these years, 30 years plus, uh, have an attitude and ideas of what we had in our training early. But I think we have new generations. Of, you know, we have the Generation Z, Generation X, Millennials, uh, Boomers, all that. And we have to gear how we approach this entry. I'm going to call it an entry or a shikaku. What angle are we going to uh, come into this? You know, and we need to think of... Um, how we're going to be more inclusive, you know, with a lot of things, diversity, racism, all that is part of it is community. That's going to be a factor. And uh, how do we preserve the culture and how do we develop a new culture? And um, we found out that, you know, just some of these students, we're in an, an academic collegiate community. And over the past five years, especially 10, I see it. I see a new generation that do not get, the uh, tradition that I love so dearly. I mean, I love the dojo, the coming into it, the hakama, the ritual of all that. That's been a big part of why I have been so uh, engaged over the years. So I think um, we need to think of this and uh, how we approach some of this. And be f in some respect, you know, it's going to be a new mentality of how we uh, develop this new paradigm. But anyway, yeah, just. It is uh, going to be different, and I, I am interested to hear other areas, because we are here in Blacksburg. It has increased slightly uh, with the college students coming back. The cases have uh, gone up slightly because of their activity. And so, and so we are kind of in a, a hiatus of going back on campus. So we are looking for new ways to approach this uh, like uh, Yvonne Sensei says, we're outdoors sometimes. How do you go indoor in the winter? I do Tai Chi on Wednesday outdoor and it works very nice, you know, because you're six feet apart. There's no connection. And uh, just like the Joe and Weapon, I think the Iwama style has a very good advantage of having such an intense repertoire of weapon practice. That's one thing I think now has, will benefit that style. We have some, but not as, as you know. But anyway, I'll let other people talk. 
Well, Truman Sensei, you gave us more questions than answers. I want <laughs> answers. <laughs> well, I don't know. I'm thinking. <laughs> Aviv, I think you uh, kind of uh, hinted at one of the directions we can go um, with the family unit training. I think that um, those units which are able to be around each other without masks can train in the traditional contact way. And um, that was one of the things I had on my list. And when I heard you say that, I said, wow, he's already doing that. That's fantastic. It, but it's a bridge. I think um, that before this all hit in January or this year, um, Aikido was already on the rocks. Um, dojos are aging. We have a bad online reputation. Sure. And um, I think that we really need to think of how do we bridge the, the, the COVID problem just to get back to where we needed to be, uh, figuring out how to reestablish Aikido as, as a moral, effective self-defense that would have a popular interest and support and have new blood coming into dojos. Um, Brian Sensei's got a, a good children's program that helps, but what I have always found is that children go away to college. College students, move out of town when they get a job. It's only the, the younger adults that are somewhere grounded and can stick with it, with, and keep a dojo alive, keep it well supported, and uh, have training that goes on long enough to develop the kind of skill that someone would say, hey, I want to learn from him or her. Yeah, I, th I think that there is starting to be a, a loss of physical skill um, with our with our dojos, um, uh, I I don't know where that's that's coming from. I guess um, maybe we we have folks that are people people should join. People um, will join at, at various points in their life, and they they find various things that that are important and help to deepen their path in life. But if a person joins at forty. Um, they don't always have the same physical manifestation of skills as somebody who uh, was like my teachers, who uh, in their teens became Uchideshis and spent several years studying their very hard kind of, kind of practice. Um, those kinds of people manifest physical skills that, um, that uh, attract people in. So uh, I think it's, again, important that the folks receive when they're, when they're older, um, but it's just simply not the same thing. Um, so younger people are being attracted into physical kind of practice that they see with MMA and BJJ and, and et cetera. And um, I'm not sure exactly what we're going to do about that. That's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting, Brian Sensei. I, I see actually, um, you know, that Aikido offers tremendous opportunity for other demographics, um, for children, uh, learning effective self-defense with a compassionate uh, core couldn't be better. Um, and so if somebody starts um, when they're young, or even as a freshman in high school, they could have a showdown by the time they get off to college. Yes. And uh, similarly, think about who has um, you know time to train and resources and benefits a lot from the socialization. I think it's older people, and we have a very large population in our dojo of senior citizens. And um, I think Aikido is going to see a lot of. Uh, benefits for senior citizens and attraction for them as well. And yes, the Waza looks different, uh, but we're all just said that, you know, techniques are but a stepping stone along the way. So uh, I, I, I'd like I, to see Aikido be more inclusive on, on both spectrums. I, I agree. We have a, we have a practitioner who's uh, 
this cross the line for 70 here, and he's quite an inspiration to uh, to everyone. Um, but I think what you are doing in terms of um, a full spectrum kind of kind of dojo like you have out there is an inspiration for us here. Um, just uh, tough to be able to to manifest that for for all of us, even um, yeah, all of all of the challenges of household and and other things. Yeah, thank you. I I, I would say Aviv that uh, you know thank you for the inspiration um, and ideas for a way forward from the panel. Uh, COVID was something that no one saw uh, at all. Um, we were hoping to have our second annual. Uh, seminar here with the Risway and Nakamichi Sensei. Uh, they were very happy to come and more than likely bring uh, several members from their dojos uh, along with us. Um, and that's what we were hoping to do since the Nishio community is so small in the U.S. Um, that didn't happen. Our, uh, every five years, there's a big international uh, memorial, Gashku for Nishio Sensei in Japan. That was planned and scheduled for November. That was canceled. Uh, due to COVID as well, and that's uh, understandably so. Um, my situation here, uh, you know, I had a small group. We trained at the Capital Area Budokai. They were kind enough to allow me to uh, start a uh, small group up there um, where I'm a member and I practice uh, Nakamura Rubato Do and uh, Shindamusa Rujoto as well. So they were very happy to have an Aikido group start there. We had a small, small group there. Um, and with COVID, uh, just happened to coincide with the lease on the facility that they were in uh, expiring. And then we were looking to move to a new location, which hasn't happened yet uh, due to the, the whole COVID situation. So I'm without a, I'm a wanderless Aikido guy <laughs> in Virginia right now. Unfortunately, I had such high hopes after last year um, that I could really get something sustainable uh, and something of value to the Aikido community in Virginia here. Um, I hope going forward that I'll be able to do that. I think uh, as far as relevance goes and uh, the future of Aikido, um, I, I, I think Brian made some really effective points there. Um, you know, I always tell people that want to train with me uh, who don't know anything about Aikido. And a lot of these people have backgrounds in other martial arts, such as karate or judo or kendo or some kind of swordsmanship or whatnot. And what I always tell them is Aikido is something you have to feel. And personally, I, I kind of get a kick out of when I hear a disparaging remark on, oh, that's Aikido, right? Well, that's, that doesn't play well with me because as John Driscoll sensei says, after all, it is a martial art, right? And it is. And I think the, the relevance of Aikido in the future is, is the, the technique has to be effective. Um, I like uh, Truman, I think had some great uh, points too. You know, th th there's a whole moral foundation uh, with the Reho doing uh, Masuku at, at, at the end, at the beginning and the end having a little bit of meditation there, clearing your mind. We're in the hakama, bowing to the showman, right? Kneeling when the sensei is instructing, acknowledging that with a slight bow, right? And uh, I think that, that these are things that are very valuable that I don't think Aikido should give up. I think that's, that that's a lot of the attraction is that there is a moral foundation here. And the techniques are extremely effective, right? I mean, I personally, I... I have no issue showing someone the effectiveness of the technique in a nice way, right? I mean, get them on the mat, let them understand, okay, you know what, I guess this really does work. How does that sound to you, right? And I've been able to convince quite a few people, wow, th th this is interesting. And just a kind of a humorous uh, note here at the very end before I finish. Um, 15 years ago, maybe, I took John Driscoll to a... Uh, Aikido, I mean, a karate gashku with, uh, with my Aikido organization, karate organization that I have belonged to for 30 something years. And we were asked to give a demonstration. And instead of giving a karate demonstration, 
we gave a Tonto Dory demonstration using Aikido. And this was, uh, this was before I kind of became, I was pretty much a novice in Aikido at the time. And uh, later that night, basically I was John Driscoll's uke. So anyone who knows John Driscoll realizes how that ended up for me, right? <laughs> so um, very convincing demonstration. So later that night, there's a banquet and uh, we're at the bar and uh, a couple of people come over and say, so that was Aikido? And John goes, yeah, that was Aikido. And uh, two of these gentlemen say, well, that was not like any Aikido I've ever seen. And John Driscoll puts his beer down and smiles and says, well, after all, it is a martial art, right? So, I mean, I think what Brian Sensei said is keeping it relevant, that it's effective, it has a moral foundation. And, and also the, the whole Reho and the tradition behind it and the Shugio aspect, taking what you learn in the dojo, right? Avoidance of conflict, conflict resolution, et cetera, outside of the dojo and using those opportunities to talk to your students about that as well, I think, I think is really important. So, so anyways, thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. So. Yeah, thanks. Steve Wolf, you haven't weighed in on this. Oh, I've enjoyed listening to all of this. I think, you know, you look at the state of politics in this country and you look at what martial arts are popular right now. And you, if you look at the music business, you see that people are moving towards computer music and yelling and uh, putting the time in to, to learn a craft and to, to practice. You know, somebody mentioned Mastery, the book, George Leonard book, which I love earlier. Um, I think everybody needs to read that in our society right now um, to, to get grounded again. You know, I think you know, this COVID thing has got everybody ungrounded too. And I think we have to hold our ground because I think we're really needed. I mean, I'll admit, you know, I came into Aikido still with a fighting mind. One of Shainer Sensei's quotes of watching me and, and one of the first times he saw me is, you look like you want to throw somebody. <laughs> You know, and but you know, it evolved over time. And I came into yoga as a yoga teacher, well, as a practitioner first to, for the workout of it, and then it grew into the philosophy of it over time. So I think we as teachers, we have to hold our ground and try our best to be an example of the things that we sell. Um, and I think there's going to be a core element in our society that's going to be looking for those values. And uh, hopefully there'll be enough of them that we can all stay doing what we do and practicing what we do. I, I agree. I think that there's going to be an, an ebb and a flow to what we're doing. I think, um, you know, uh, we have to stay true to what our art is and that will attract people the same way as it attracted uh, attracted us um, and I think that we we have to also work on some well I, I think personally for myself I have to work on some issues of, of looking into the future some legacy building in terms of handing off some skills to specific students to, to make sure that when people come in here that they're able to um, that they're able to encounter somebody who has physical skills to be able to represent the art. But um, we can't, even even as, as I'm being confronted here with a loss of students at times, folks going over to different MMA or BJJ, I think that that's just a completely different thing, a different animal than what we are. So um, I, it's caused me to look and, and um, redouble down on some of the things that we've received through our art from the founder and uh, try to stay clear with those things. Yeah, wow. Uh, what an amazing discussion. Um, there's a lot I want to reflect on here. And so we will... Um, eventually get this video up on our YouTube channel. So it's, it's free for everybody to review. 
And uh, I do want to uh, thank each of the instructors for taking their time today. Uh, and it's clear that you've been thinking about these things for quite some time and, uh, you know, are developing plans to move forward both during COVID and after COVID, and, and that's what it takes. Um, I do want to also thank the students because the teachers without a student, uh, you know, you're just uh, talking to yourself. And so uh, I feel blessed here. We've had many students who have maintain their membership through the dojo, even if they haven't been able to train as much as they like. And I want to encourage everybody to continue to support your, your own dojo so that we can continue to have Aikido uh, next week, next month, next year, and, and next decade. I'm not quite thinking yet about the next century, but you know, we'll do that uh, next time we meet. Uh, I look forward to the day when we can get together as a big group again and train. And we will have the next Common Ground Seminar. I don't know if it'll be in 21 or 22, but we will do it. We'll grab each other's wrists and we'll throw each other around, regardless of whether we want to throw each other or we just, it's what, it's what has to happen. Um, so uh, we all look forward to that. And I do want to mention to everybody who's, um, who's watching that all of the various dojos around Virginia right now some have outdoor classes, some have uh, online classes. Please take this opportunity to go and explore a little bit. Uh, I was telling my own stu students today that 80% uh, of your Aikido should be core, should be focused on the principles that you and your dojo uh, have. But there's room for some exploration. For some people, the Common Ground Seminar was the only time they ever trained outside their own dojo. And I think people are missing out a little bit. Um, as Steve Wolf Sensei said today, uh, there are many roads to the top of Mount Fuji, but there's only one summit, right? So we're all climbing different paths. Sometimes we don't even know who's on the path or where they're on the path, but Aikido is a big enough tent that it can include everybody. And I look forward to uh, training with uh, each of the senseis again and with all the students again, and take this spirit of cooperation and commonality and see if you can apply it to other parts of your life and see what kind of synergies you can create there. So everybody, Gato, thank you very much. Oh, Leave cool. Sensei, thank you very much for putting this on. And as I tell all of, uh, all of my students, uh, you are an example. Uh, of, of what a, uh, a real dojo manifestation is with everything that you, you've constructed out there. So um, it's, it's wonderful what you do here in terms of the, the common ground. So Thank you. Thank you all. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Elise Sensei, very Thank much. You, Sensei. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And everybody. Be healthy, everyone. Stay safe. Great pictures of you.